Hi, my name is Michael Payne. Um, I'm a senior athletic training student here at Emory and Henry College. Um, I did my study on the effectiveness of joint mobilizations on range of motion in an athlete with a Van Cart lesion, and it was a case study. So just a little bit of background. Um, this last summer I had the amazing experience of working a internship, an athletic training internship with the NFL. Um, I worked with the Arizona Cardinals and basically throughout that internship um, I had many interactions with different ATs, PTs, and physicians. They had four head, well one head athletic trainer followed by three other um, certified athletic trainers on staff. They had two PTs there for the duration of camp and then they had uh, lots of different positions from orthopedic specialists to just dentists, to optometrists, to everything. They had everything there. Um, that's kind of my claim to fame on the picture there. I got to drive the cart when someone got hurt. But um, what I noticed, uh, on a daily basis, their PT that worked with us, his name was Brett Fisher. Um, Brett had his own station in the athletic training room. And we noticed that a lot of the players tended to line up to be with Brett and not with us. Um, when we asked him, or what we kind of noticed was he had this thing, it was a seatbelt. And what he would do, athletes would lay down on the table, he put the seatbelt um, usually around their hip, closest to the head of the femur as he could, snap it behind his belt, sit back, and just kind of work on their legs. And at the time, a lot of us wanted to know, we were like, all right, well, that seems pretty cool. Uh, what is it? Why are all these people lining up to do it? So I went up to him one day, and I said, you know, hey, what's that thing you do with the seatbelt, and why is there people always, you know, waiting to get it done? And uh, he explained that it was a type of joint mobilization. Um, basically, distraction was using the belt and leaning back, and then doing internal external rotation to work on range of motion. So I thought it was pretty cool, and he ended up showing me how to do it. But I decided to get some different opinions. So I went to the head athletic trainer, Tom Reed, and the other three ATCs and asked them, you know, why don't you guys do that? Why aren't you out there? Why are the athletes all waiting on him? And they responded with, you know, he's a PT, so that's the one reason all the athletes think that they're a lot better than ATs. And secondly, that he really didn't believe in doing them that often. Um, Tom and another AT said that they don't believe in doing joint mobilizations because they're not quite effective enough and that the effects of them, as a matter of fact, um, lasted for maybe one day, two days, and then basically the structure would strengthen back up or become tight again and they'd just come back in and say, hey, can you do it again? And they didn't really believe in using it. The other two ATs I talked to said that they thought it was a great tool. They said it really helps, um, even if it helps the athlete think in their mind, you know, I feel better, I feel loose, you know, I'm going to do better, or whether it's just actually increasing the range of motion and helping athletes perform better. So basically the general feelings between them was half said they liked them, the other half said, you know, I don't really bother with them. So that kind of led to my question, well, how effective are they? So basically we're going to go over what are joint mobilizations. Joint mobilizations, they're skilled, passive, so you're doing this, the athlete has to do nothing. Skilled, passive movements of the articular surfaces of a joint. Basically a joint where two bones meet, you're using the articular surfaces. What are they used for? Some indications, um, pain relief. Um, as we get to later on, we have multiple forms of joint mobilizations. Um, some are used for pain relief to increase joint mobility, so that helps treat hypomobility, which is a lack of joint mobility, and to help decrease guarding and spasms. Some contraindications when you want, wouldn't want to use these include um, infectious arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. Arthritis, you may have heard before, it's not good to distract a joint if they're having arthritic or arthritic problems because it can cause a flare up or increase the inflammation in the joint. Um, if you suspect of a fracture, you can only imagine with joint mobilization, you are moving two bones. Um, even with the, or the traction placed on it, you still don't want to risk having a fracture and the two bones hitting together and you just aggravating and making it worse. And excessive pain and swelling and hypermobility. I'll get to hypermobility in, in a little while, but excessive pain and swelling. If they have excessive swelling in the joint, their body's telling them, look, you know, we're not ready for motion yet. We're trying to go ahead and still repair ourselves and you don't want to push it too early. And excessive pain. When you do joint mobilizations, there should be no pain with these. If you're doing this in an athlete and there is pain, you could probably just need to go ahead and stop give them some more time, you know, kind of do it on later down the road. So how are they performed? There's grades, as I said before, there's five different grades. Grade one is a small amplitude movement at the beginning of the range of motion. So basically you just have them there, they're nice small little motions, nothing too crazy. 
And then grade two is large amplitude motions to the midpoint of their range of motion. So it's a little bit bigger than the grade one, and both of these grades are primarily used for pain. Grade three is a large amplitude motion from the midpoint of the range of motion to the end point of the range of motion. This is seeing how far they can get to, and it's a large motion, so you're going all the way through it. A grade four is a small amplitude movement to the end of the range of motion. So what you tend to do, put your traction, take them as far as they can go, and then just nice, easy little motions. Those primarily are used to increase the range of motion because you're kind of pushing how far the joint capsule stretches or the ligament surrounding can stretch or the muscle surrounding can stretch and allowing the joint um, more mobility. The fifth and uh, final grade we don't really use that much as ATs. It's kind of a high velocity small amplitude motion at the very end point of range of motion. Basically the example that we give here is when chiropractors um, adjust someone's back. Usually they use the nice small jerky motion Especially if they go for your neck, they put your neck already in mobility, kind of let down end point, and then small, quick, try to go ahead and reset. When you're doing range of motion, there's a few complicated things here, unfortunately. One of them being roll versus roll and glide. Roll and glide refer to the motions that are done um, from the articular surfaces during joint mobilizations. And anytime you're doing a mobilization, there's a combination of roll and glide. The roll always occurs with the bone that is being moved. So the mobile bone always has the roll. And the more congruent um, the joint is, the more glide, the less incongruent, um, the more roll. So if you think about it, I don't have props unfortunately, I have to use my hands. If you have a joint that's more closed in and congruent, there's gonna be more of a glide when you move it. If it's farther point, it's gonna have to roll to get to the point where it's starting to go to. So when you're doing this, this is the biggest thing about joint mobilizations. If there's nothing you take away from here, it's this rule right here. This is the primary premise behind joint mobilizations, and that is the concave versus convex rule. In the concave versus convex rule it states that if a concave, which is pretty much like a hollowed out or like a fossa, um, is moving on a convex, the roll and the glide go in opposite directions. So basically, if you're looking at the picture on the left here, you have a fixed, concave, or convex, and a concave rotating on it. The motion you're applying, you can see the X in the check mark, is the opposite of where the check mark is. So you're rolling the body, you're opposite. If you have a convex acting on a concave, um, roll and glide are in the same direction. So you take a look at the picture on the right, you have a concave acting on a convex. Treatment wise, you're gonna do, if you're looking at that, an inferior motion, and that's gonna be in the same direction as the uh, motion you're looking to increase. So when are they mainly used? In a clinical setting, um, ATs like to use these for rehabilitation purposes. Someone just comes out of rehabilitation, you work on decreasing their pain and their swelling, and then they get to a point where you need to increase their range of motion. A lot of athletes um, either are scared or just have limiting factors in their range of motion. They'll go up as far as they can go and say, you know, it feels like that's all I can get, there's no give, that's all I have. So this is a good way to use joint mobilizations to help that athlete push through the range of motion. If they're scared, this is completely passive, so they don't have to do anything themselves, so they don't have to worry about overdoing it. So this is all in the AT's hands. Um, precautions, this comes back to the hypermobility. Joint mobilizations, since they do increase, or we think they increase range of motion, uh, when you use them, you tend to have the joint become more mobile, and if it gets hypermobile, you start to run into a problem to where the structures around the shoulder aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, they're not keeping the head of the humerus in that glenoid fossa or in the glenoid labrum, and you can lead to increased risk of injury, more specifically uh, subluxation or dislocation of the humeral head. So that's just something you gotta watch while you're doing it. Don't do it every day, you know, kind of taper it on and off. So some basic shoulder anatomy here. So the shoulder girdle is the most mobile in the body which again could be good and bad. The advantage of this is you have good mobility and if you have good mobility, you can actually decrease the injury risk. So, I mean, it's good, but at the same time, again, the hypermobility thing comes into play and it reduces stress on muscles and allows free movement. I worked with a division three wide receiver. You can imagine when he's going out for football or for a catch, mobility is a really good thing. Disadvantages, however, again, too hypermobile or <laughs> too much motion 
can lead to increased risk of injury. So again, the structures aren't holding and providing stability the way it should be, and you lead to dislocations or subluxations. So maybe bony structures, articulating surfaces, um, really right here, the three main bones I want to mention are just the clavicle, the scapula, and the humerus. The only articulating things that you have here is the head of the humerus on the part of the scapula called the glenoid fossa, which houses the glenoid labrum. This provides the ball and socket joint for the shoulder, which allows it to be the most mobile. Attaching to the body, another reason why it's so mobile is because there's only one, one bone attaching the shoulder to the body, and that is the clavicle or collarbone. And that attaches it to the sternum, which is already far away, allowing most mobility, but higher risk of injury. Major muscles, um, you gotta look at these when, if you have an athlete go through surgery, you gotta look at atrophy in these muscles. The main ones I really wanna just kinda mention are the deltoids, which is the anterior, middle, and posterior deltoid. And then the rotator cuff, which is comprised of the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, um, subscapularis, and teres minor. These again kind of surround the head of the humerus and act to stabilize it inside the glenoid fossa, preventing it from sliding out and causing a dislocation. Major soft tissue structures, the big one here is the glenoid labrum. The labrum pretty much deepens that fossa and provides more of a um, structural stability to the head of the humerus to keep it in there and the ball and socket joint working well. So some common injuries here. Again, most mobile, more chance for an in injury. The most common ones include impingement. This can be impingement of nerve roots, um, or it could be impingement of tendons. For example, your supraspinatus runs through a little groove. If that, or if that supraspinatus tendon becomes inflamed, or there's swelling in that area, it can become compressed, and you can start seeing different symptoms. Also, nerve compression, you can start seeing um, numbness, tingling, radiating pain down into the arm or down into the thoracic area. Instability is another common one. This results um, from, say, dislocations, subluxations, or um, too many joint mopes. What this does is basically the structures uh, surrounding the head of the humerus are too lax, too loose, and again, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. You run into a lot of problems. Rotator cuff pathology, whether this includes rotator cuff tear, rotator cuff tendon, tendinopathy, or rotator cuff tendonitis, um, this is a lot common in overhead athletes because your shoulders so you you know used overused there's a lot of overuse injuries and then labral pathology whether it's slap tear or bank heart lesion or just a regular tear those are the most common risk factors with this are age gender and sport age the reason why you're at a higher risk um, the younger you are is because your body hasn't had time to fully develop your muscles aren't as strong um, and your rotator cuffs not as strong it's not able to hold in that uh, humeral head as well as they should, hence you're at more chance to dislocate or sublux. Gender, um, gender kind of ties in with sport and the fact that male and female sports tend to be a lot different. Um, male sports, for example, like baseball is all overhead while you have more of an underarm, or underarm um, throwing motion with softball, and then contact sports such as football. And then sport, of course, as I talked about, contact sports and overhead sports um, make you more at risk for these types of injuries. So what is a bank heart lesion? It's a type of labral pathology result from a dislocation or subluxation. Some symptoms you might see with this are clicking, catching sensation when you're doing your special testing such as clunk, um, grind, and crank. You'll see anterior shoulder pain and shoulder instability, apprehension and laxity. Apprehension you see when you go to put them in an externally rotated um, place because it's forcing the humeral head anteriorly which is gonna hit the lesion. And then the treatment um, can be surgical or can be non-surgical, but most likely a surgical. Non-surgical just, you know, kind of masks it, helps everything to hold it in so it doesn't happen again, but it doesn't fix the problem. Surgery must be done to correct this injury. So there's two types, open bank cart repair and arthroscopic repair. The open bank cart repair, um, it's more, uh, it's not, I don't know how I want to say it. I'll just go to the car. So it has a lower reoccurrence rate, making it the golden standard for treating this but it's a longer rehabilitation and unfortunately has um, cutbacks and range of motion. Arthroscopic repair is less invasive, but has a higher recurrence rate, about 15%, compared to open bank heart, which is only 10%. But it does not um, impact range of motion as much and leads to a quickly, um, a more quick recovery. Which one's better? You gotta look at your age, sport, and recurrence rate. 
For a contact sport, it's suggested that you do an open bank cart just because of the recurrence rate it's lower and you're going to be having more contact with it. You don't want it to reoccur. Age, you're a little bit younger, you're not as developed, so you can do a bank cart or an arthroscopic repair just to the fact that you can get your rehab done, get ready, and start strengthening the muscles around it. And the reoccurrence rate, as I said, open bank cart about 10%, arthroscopic about 15%. So my case study, last semester, had the pleasure of doing this with a 20-year-old Division III wide receiver. I had informed consent um, and focused on the effectiveness of joint mobilizations. Like I said, I only had one patient who completed a full rehab um, program. Four phases, phase one focused on um, decreasing pain and swelling, phase two focused on increasing range of motion, phase three strength, and then phase four was return to play or functional activity. So the criteria to progress were these. Um, in the first phase, once the pain, all not all, but most pain, most of the swelling was decreased, we can move on to phase two, which is increased range of motion. When the athlete uh, got to about 90% of normal range of motion, he could then progress to stage three, or phase three, which is increasing strength. Once the athlete had about 90 to 95% strength, he can continue to functional ability. And once he can come on, or once he can do functional drills without recurring symptoms or pain or swelling, he could be referred to a physician to be cleared for play. The whole time the athlete was compliant and motivated. And for my methods, after the surgery, he was referred to do a rehabilitation. So we started with modality treatment in the first couple sessions to decrease uh, pain and swelling. Um, started passive range of motion exercises and joint mobilizations were not used in this phase. The athlete was in a shoulder mobilizer when he was not doing rehab. And after two weeks, um, joint mobilizations were introduced and uh, they were done in all directions, anterior, anterior, posterior, superior, inferior, and active range of motions were taken each week. Basically, these are my results throughout the rehab. His range of motion did increase, but when shoulder uh, joint mobilizations were introduced, there was a significant or significantly noticeable increase in his range of motion. As you can see, the blue and the orange represent weeks one and two, and then gray and yellow represents three and four. And you can see from the orange to the gray in all motions, there's a noticeably bigger jump than between any other week. And that's when joint mobilizations were first used. And then from week three and four, again, you can notice a pretty substantial increase in all ranges of motion. So conclusions. Is this evidence conclusive? Unfortunately, it's not. I only had a small sample size conducting of one athlete. Um, you need to do it on a much bigger scale. And then the other factors were using ultrasound, um, muscle stem, and laser to help reduce scar tissue, swelling, pain, and those could have also contributed to the increase in range of motion. So I can't say for sure which one was the result. Limitations. Some limitations of my study, unfortunately, were the time. I only had one semester to complete this rehab, which means that I couldn't go out and look for other people who had injuries and kind of do rehabs with them. Also, the fact that I only had one athlete. Unfortunately, I can't force athletes to have bank cart lesions so I can do my study. So I kind of had to roll with one person. Some delimitations. Um, the primary one was me focusing only on joint mobilizations and the effect they had on range of motion. Um, with all the different uh, dependent variables that we had in here, or independent variables such as muscle stem, ultrasound, and all that, I wanted to combine this to one measurement or one dependent variable, which happened to be range of motion. So some ideas for future research um, would be a comparative study, take a group of people with Baycart lesions and another group, use joint mobilizations only one group and have the other group be a control group, and then compare their range of motion at the end of the study. A meta-analysis comparison, I tried to do this unfortunately, not with a lot of success, was find studies already done on joint mobilizations and then compare them to your own study. So if I could find studies that didn't use joint mobilizations and look at the range of motion measurements there, compare them to my own. And then thirdly, joint mobilization on other factors. By other factors, I mean strength, rehab time, um, reoccurrence rate, just all these different things that you can see how joint mobilization affects them on. Any questions? Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, you can't do one, right? Dead, I suspicious looking more on my shoulder. <laughs>